Powered by the Montana Television Network. Montana This Morning continues on Montana's News Leader. Americans on board the crashed Aeromexico flight are speaking out. I'm Laura Podesta with what they had to say about how all the passengers survived. The law enforcement officers here in Bozeman have been doing some intense training this week. I'm Emma Hamilton in Bozeman and I'll have the details for you coming up next. 6.30 on this Thursday, Jill Lehman, Missy O'Malley with you. Carson Vickroy has our forecast. Our top story, this is an amazing one this half hour. Americans who were on board that crashed Aero Mexico flight, they're speaking out. That's right. As CBS's news correspondent Laura Podesta reports, one family had an emotional reunion with loved ones in Chicago overnight and spoke about the horrifying accident. Among the 103 people who survived the plane crash in Mexico on Tuesday was Dorelia Rivera and her 14-year-old daughter, Kayla Martinez. Last night, they returned home to Chicago, embracing family members they thought they'd never see again. We didn't think we were going to make it. I honestly have no idea how anyone survived, not one person. Video a passenger shot during takeoff shows a gray sky and thick cloud coverage as the Aeromexico plane tried to fly out of Durango, Mexico. The cell phone video goes to black, but screams and prayers could be heard from terrified passengers. Mexican officials say the control tower reported the twin engine jetliner descended abruptly, possibly due to a severe gust of wind. The left wing appeared to hit the ground as the plane came to a stop more than 300 yards from the runway. It lost both its engines, but somehow stayed upright, allowing exit slides to deploy. Kayla Martinez says she and her mother ran as fast as they could away from the plane, which was now on fire. I really didn't think I was going to get here today. She says the entire situation still feels surreal, like a dream, and she's thankful to be home. Laura Podesta, CBS News, New York. 49 people were hospitalized in that crash. The pilot and one other person and the two others are the most seriously injured, but they're in serious but stable condition. Wow. Unbelievable, yeah. Unbelievable story. Crazy That's stuff. incredible. We're glad everybody's okay and Absolutely. wish the best to the pilot and that other person. No right kidding. Yep. Wow. Carson, uh, wildfires kind of uh, dominating our news here in Southwest Montana, mm -hmm. though we don't have any. We're getting Pretty the effects much. of them all over the West, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, over the West, if you remember that Johnny Cash song, The Ring of Fire, oh, yeah. we have about half of that right now. Take a look at this. Current wildfires burning lots of them across the West. And with that southwesterly flow, you can kind of see there on the map, we're going to see some smoky conditions as we head into this afternoon. It's going to transport some of that smoke from those California wildfires into the area and we're not seeing a lot of fires yet, but that could change because we are under a red flag warning expecting dry thunderstorms today with gusty winds and frequent lightning. So we're going to have to keep a very close eye on that. That runs through midnight on Saturday. 50s to start. We will rise into the upper 80s with a few showers and thunderstorms possible for Bozeman. Lesser chance for Butte, but rising from the 50s up into the middle to upper 80s. And we'll talk a little more about that in my full forecast here in a few minutes. Chet and Missy. Thanks, Carson. 633 now. Fatal crash has claimed the life of at least one victim in Park County overnight. Very few details have been released, but we do know the crash reported just before 1030 last night. Happened south of Livingston in the Paradise Valley on Montana Secondary Highway 571 and Immigrant Meadows Road. Montana Highway Patrol responded to the scene. We're going to update this story as details are released. And the law enforcement officers in our community are going through some intense training this week. MTN's Emma Hamilton reports from Montana State University. It's four days of simulated, real-life situations that could happen at any second. The more realistic that we can be, um, the simulations allows us to hear the gunfire go off, to feel the pain of the round hitting our bare skin. And so it really brings a lot of reality to the training, which is super important. Fortunately, it hasn't happened in the Bozeman community, but the officers must keep their skills honed. The training is really important. It's unfortunate that we have to go through this type of training because of the environment that we live in. But the facts are we have to be prepared and we have to be prepared to protect our students at all costs. It's not only MSU officers that are in the training. So we have Bozeman Police, the uh, Montana Highway Patrol, FBI agents that are taking, some of them are taking this for the first time as well, um, Gallatin County Sheriff's Office um, are training with us because in reality that's what it's going to look like in a real situation. It's going to be one or two officers from different agencies so we have to be able to work together as a team. 
This active shooter training is something that the law enforcement here in Bozeman does every year to keep their skills up to date and to keep our people safe. The chief of police at MSU says him and his team are always thinking about what they would do if an active shooter situation occurred anywhere on campus. In Bozeman, Emma Hamilton, MTN News. Now that training is continuing through Friday. If you do see increased police presence on campus, do not be alarmed. Good work for them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, so, they have to do that. That is we're glad a they're doing. sad piece of the effect, but yeah. good to know that they're doing it. For sure. In other news this morning, new indicators, including satellite images, shows that North Korea could be in the midst of building new missiles. The Washington Post reported on Monday that sighting officials are familiar with this intelligence. According to the Post, the officials say that new information reveals, reveals that work is potentially taking place on one or two liquid-fueled intercontinental ballistic missiles. Now, this is in the suburb of Pyongyang. Yeah, U.S. official cautions that the Washington Post story is consistent with what is publicly known. The intel community has publicly stated that it's seen signs of continuing activity everywhere, including fuel plants, because except for the tunnels and a bit of the satellite site, there is no denuclearization. CNN's Will Ripley has more details. More than eight months after North Korea's last missile launch, what could be a major blow to President Trump's diplomatic efforts with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The Washington Post reports North Korea may be developing new intercontinental ballistic missiles at this plant on the outskirts of Pyongyang. Seemingly a far cry from Trump and Kim's Singapore pledge to work toward complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. What we see is in real time evidence that North Korean officials don't really take this very seriously. They have no intentions of giving up everything. And that comes as no surprise when you think of, uh, of nuclear weapons as being essential, at least in the eyes of the regime, to the survival of, of Kim Jong-un and his family. A U.S. official tells CNN Kim has not made a full commitment to denuclearization. And U.S. intelligence agencies believe work continues at nearly all North Korean nuclear weapons facilities, including plants like this one, believed to produce nuclear fuel. Their production capability is still intact. Their testing capability we just saw affected uh, a few months ago in the destruction of the Pungay-ri testing site. But production is a different question. In other words, U.S. intelligence says no significant signs of denuclearization contradicting this tweet from President Trump one day after Singapore, declaring there is no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea. North Korea continues to produce fissile material, nuclear bomb material. Is that correct? Yes, they continue to produce vessel material. Defense officials say the kind of liquid-fueled missiles North Korea may be developing right now don't pose a major threat. They have to be rolled out and fueled up before launch, giving the U.S. plenty of advance warning. The big challenge, one official says, learning as much as possible about North Korea's nuclear arsenal before they declare their inventory so the U.S. can make sure Kim Jong-un is telling the truth. Will Ripley, CNN. Staying on the international scene for just a minute, uh, your uh, favorite gadget may soon become more expensive uh, since the Trump administration has proposed tariffs on some $200 billion worth of goods that are actually made in China. Now that, of course, includes the circuit boards and other parts of your phone and your computers. Samuel Burke has been looking into this from London. President Trump's trade war is barreling toward Silicon Valley. We are demanding fair and reciprocal trade. The latest round of proposed tariffs targets the Chinese hardware fueling the tech sector. Things like semiconductors and electronic circuits. There are certain kinds of machines that uh, you and I never come into contact with, but that uh, underpin a lot of the high-tech products that people buy. They're the key components that make smart devices, household appliances, and home security systems hum. Everyday items like the iPad could be hit. The tablet has a chip from Intel, which could be a target. E-scooters have taken off this year. Now they face a 25% tariff. Even your favorite Netflix series could be in the firing line. The streaming company's videos are played from the Amazon cloud server, and that equipment comes from China. Missing from the list, the Apple iPhone. CEO Tim Cook told CNN in June he thought the device was safe. I don't think that iPhone will uh, get a tariff on it, is, is my, uh, my belief, based on what I've been told in, in, 
and what I see, uh, I, I just don't see that. Now the president says he's ready to tax almost all Chinese imports, which would include the iPhone. They went after our companies and they stole our intellectual property. The administration says the tariffs are meant to pressure China to fall in line, but experts say a levy on the iPhone would be counterproductive. Even though the device is assembled in China, it's designed and manufactured in the U.S. 90% of that tariff falls on value created by Americans. It, it is, there's no other way to say it than to say that literally the United States is taxing itself. And Apple may have the most to lose if China retaliates with tariffs of its own. 21% of the company's sales are in China, leaving a clear target on America's most valuable company. Samuel Burke, CNN, London. More to follow on that. Uh, we'll Much continue more to follow, follow what happens with all of that. That's right. We do have to take a quick break. Up next, Butte Silverbow's annual county fair is kicking off. The fun and activities you can expect, that's all ahead. Before that, though, let's check in with Nora O'Donnell, see what's coming up at 7 o'clock on CBS This Morning. Good morning ahead on CBS This Morning. New stories of survival from Americans on board the jetliner that crashed in Mexico. They describe the moment the plane slammed into the ground and how everyone got out alive. Plus, are you thinking of submitting your DNA to a genealogy website? Well, Dr. David Agus is here in Studio 57 with some of the unintended consequences. Who are they selling your data to? And only on CBS This Morning, The Daily Show's Trevor Noah joins us with a new book on how Twitter has reshaped the presidency. See you right at 7.